Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Corn Baptist Church. It's good to have you with us in church, and it's good to have those joining with us on the live stream as well this morning. After our service today, there's a chance to share fellowship together, uh, not over a cup of coffee in the hall, but uh, online on a Zoom meeting. Uh, details are in the notice sheet for that. Uh, it's something like this. The Sunday Club children and their families and teachers meet together at 11.30 and they share a bit of time together sharing their uh, crafts and things that they've been doing. And then the whole church is invited to join in at 11.45. No need to worry if you're uh, concerned about a screen full of faces because we do break down into smaller groups during that fellowship chat as well. So uh, you can talk to or um, in one go, you've not got to talk to 20 people at the same time. This evening at 6.30 p.m. there's a prayer meeting, which is also on the Zoom platform, as is uh, in the week, an opportunity to join with Alistair and Rose's lookout group for a time of sharing on Thursday evening. Again, details for those things are in the notice sheet. As we begin our worship this morning, I'd like to read just three verses from Psalm 145 to draw us to our worship of God. I will exalt you, my God, the King, I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can understand. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. We know a song that starts with that line, but we're not going to sing that this morning. But we are going to sing about our great big God. Our God is a great big God. Uh, if you're a regular with Corn Baptist Church, the ending of this version is slightly different to our normal ending, so don't be caught out at the end. But let's sing together, quietly behind your mask, joining in singing with the actions maybe. At home you can sing as loud as you like and the actions can be as big as you like. Our God is a great big God. Thank you. 
to that several times yesterday and I still got caught out at the end with the three choruses at the end before the final section. Well, whether you're young or whether you're old, I want you to spend a moment thinking about something which is very special to you, something that's very important to you. Maybe if you're little, it might be something like a cuddly toy or for three out of four of my children, it would have been a blanket. Maybe if you're a bit older, the same, it might still be a cuddly toy, or maybe something different. But just think for a moment about something that's very important to you, very special to you. Okay, now I'd like you to think about something else. Think about payday. And maybe it's the day you get your pocket money. I like that day. Maybe it's the day you get your work pay. Maybe it's the day you get your pension. Think about that for a moment. And think about how you'd feel if payday didn't happen, it should. You see, money and the things we have are very important to us, aren't they? It's not surprising, therefore, that Jesus often talks about money and possessions. A lot of his stories are called parables, and 11 different parables are about money in some way. And sometimes Jesus told those stories to teach about money itself, the right things to do with money and the wrong things to do with money. But sometimes he told those stories to teach about other things, things which should be important to us. And this morning in Sunday Club and in church, we're looking at parables of Jesus that are about these things. I think the one I'm doing in church is deemed too difficult for the people that prepare the Sunday Club material because it's not on the Energize um, website that they use. But the Sunday Club are doing the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price, two of Jesus' stories. And here in church, we'll be looking at the parable of the shrewd manager. They're all stories which Jesus used about money and about important things, special things, to help to teach us more about God and more about the things that we should do. Let's spend a moment in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the way that you taught your disciples and all the people while you are on the earth. We thank you that your teaching is written down in the Bible for us so that we can learn more about you and learn how to do the things that you want us to do. As we spend time this morning worshipping you and praying and looking at the Bible and doing our activities, please help us, Jesus, to know you better and to make you the most important thing in our life. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Whether things are going well for us at the moment or whether things are a struggle, then we can trust in Jesus to guide us and to be like a lighthouse, bringing us to a safe place in him. Let's listen to the song or sing at home, in my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out my lighthouse, my lighthouse.
In my wrestling and in my doubts In my failures you won't walk out Your great love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea In the silence you won't let go In the questions your truth will hold Your great love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea normally help to lead our services are not uh, yet meeting with us again because they're shielding and so Jean's going to lead our prayers this morning by uh, video link or pre-recorded video link so Jean is going to lead us in our prayers now let us pray this morning we're thinking about treasure Treasure is precious. I'd like to remind us all that we are precious to God. The psalmist says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. Thank you, God, that you made each one of us to a specific design that you chose. You gave us different qualities that make us special. And that means that you have a different task for each one of us. Thank God now for any God-given gift that he has blessed you with and with which you can bless others. Maybe integrity, loyalty, generosity, wisdom, patience, encouragement.
and thank God too for the gifts that you see in others. Treasure is valuable and it needs looking after. But the Samaritan took pity on him, went to him and bandaged his wounds. Then he took care of him. How can we help those in our fellowship and our neighbours with little deeds of kindness? Think of those that you know in our fellowship who need our prayers for healing, for encouragement, for those waiting for appointments. Treasure needs to be shared. God gave us his most precious treasure when he gave us Jesus. He calls us to share this good news. Remember, you are a chosen people that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Let's pray for our missionaries, for Alan and Megan in Nepal, for Brian and Ruthie in San Francisco, for Ian and Juliana in Colombia, and for Trevor and Jan and Estelle settling into retirement, a new chapter of their lives. Let's pray that God would protect them all as they serve him amid the COVID-19 epidemic. Let's pray that they might show the love of God in their service of others. And we have that job too here in Quorn. Let's pray for our leadership team as they continue to seek the way forward and open up the church to our community and keep in touch with those who are still shielding at home. Pray for each one of us that we might recognize opportunities to share the good news that is so precious to us. Amen. Let's continue in a prayerful attitude and perhaps thinking about our own devotion and uh, relationship with God as we share in the song, Lord, I come to you, let my heart be changed, renewed.
reading this morning is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, and the first uh, 15 verses. Luke, chapter 16. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 400. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than other people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, sorry, if you, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees, who loved money, heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight.
So we continue our series on parables from Luke's gospel. And here Jesus, it seems, is teaching his disciples in particular. It begins in verse one, Jesus told his disciples. But by the time we get down to verse one, it seems that the Pharisees are there as well. So it's not just his disciples only, but the Pharisees are in the crowd as well. It's difficult to know with this parable exactly where the parable stops and Jesus starts sort of sharing the meaning of the parable. It's probably halfway through verse eight. In fact, it's not even necessarily clear whether all of this happened at the same time. It may be that Jesus told this story and explained a little bit in verses eight and nine, and then Luke adds some other teaching of Jesus that happened at a different time, but it was about a similar theme. We need to remember again, of course, that Jesus was a traveling teacher, and he probably taught about the same things in different places and different times. And then the gospel writers brought together the teaching. And so it may be that sometimes he taught about these two things together. Sometimes they may wait on different occasions. In fact, if you look at different Bible translations, and if you've got a few different translations at home, you can have a look at this for yourselves. Different Bible translations put paragraph headings in different places through Luke chapter 16. I just had a quick look at four translations yesterday, and they had different places where they put the divisions. But remember that those things are added by the translators, even the chapter numbers and the chapter verses are added by the translators afterwards. They're not part of the original text. They're just to help us, guide us through. But we should remember that sometimes you want to continue reading across a chapter to, to get things into context, or even though there's a paragraph heading in your version of the Bible, just jump over and see how it fits into the next bit, because sometimes they do continue, and sometimes there is a clear break in the text. So let's think a little bit about the story itself. The master is clearly very wealthy. The amounts owed to him are very large indeed. And the two that are mentioned are just two examples, it seems, the, the debts that were adjusted by the manager. Probably there were other debtors too. And they're very large amounts that are owed to the master. It would be quite common for such a master to have several servants and to have one in charge of his property, in charge of his accounts, if you like, a business manager. But this manager, we learn, is dishonest. He's given that particular title in verse eight, but we learn it through the story. He's been wasting his master's possessions. And that's the same adjective there as the prodigal son from the previous chapter. The prodigal son wasted possessions when he asked for the inheritance. And this manager is wasting his master's possessions. I'm not sure exactly what he was doing wrong. Part of it was probably sort of fiddling things in a way that he could siphon off some of the master's wealth for himself or charge his master's debtors a bit extra so that he could put it in his own pocket instead of the master's pocket. But we do see that part of that was wasting the master's possessions. So the master was losing out as well. And then we get to the end of the story and the master commends the manager, the dishonest manager. But he doesn't commend him for dishonesty, does he? He commends him for his shrewdness, for his shrewdness. When the manager has been caught out, he knows that his time is limited. He's going to lose his job. Most likely he'll lose his home as well. He probably lives on the estate. He knows this and therefore he acts appropriately. His time is limited. So he uses wealth in order to gain future favours. He's hoping that some of these people who he, he lets off part of their debts will put him up 
for a while. It may be that the debts he writes off are just actually the extra interest that he charged himself. We can't be certain about that. He could also be costing the manager a bit more money. Nevertheless, he's very shrewd. He knows his time is limited and he acts accordingly in order to protect his future, to benefit his future. So what does this mean for us, this parable? What does it mean today? In brief, we can sum up the application in this way. Be like the dishonest manager and don't be like the dishonest manager. Be like the dishonest manager and don't be like the dishonest manager. First of all, we should be like him, using worldly wealth and opportunity to win friends. For the manager, it's because he knows his time in that employment is coming to an end. For us, we should be aware that our time on earth is limited. We will not live on earth forever in this life. For either the Lord will return or our lives will come to an end. So we should use the time we have for the future because there is a time after this life. Are we urgent? Are we shrewd in what we're doing now that will affect our futures? Jesus uses the phrase so that we'd be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Now, this is not to do with as being saved and having a place in heaven, because that's not based on how we use our wealth and our opportunities in this life. That's based on trusting in Jesus, who died on the cross, that we can be forgiven. But there is a commendation in heaven, a reward in heaven for faithful service. It may be that if we use our opportunities and our wealth, then maybe there'll be someone in heaven that's there because we sent money to a mission organization. Maybe there'll be someone in heaven because we invested time in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Be shrewd, use your time, your energy, your possessions in such a way that you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Perhaps we can note John Wesley's advice. Earn all you can. Save all you can. Give all you can. That is, there's nothing wrong with being diligent in work so that you earn money. Earn all you can. Motion is dependent on hard work and honesty and diligence in your work. Save all you can. John Wesley didn't mean put it in the bank for later. He meant don't use it on frivolous living. Don't use it all on luxuries. Because then if you save what you can, you have more to give to other causes. I remember reading many years ago that John Wesley, as his work progressed, his writings started to earn him a lot of money but he lived on more or less the same amount throughout his many many years of ministry and he was really preaching from 1730s through to the 1790s so it was a long ministry but he lived on the same amount even though his income kept on going up he didn't increase his luxuries along with his income earn all you can save all you can give all you can and then perhaps we'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. There is a judgment for Christians. We don't avoid judgment because we trust in Jesus. But it's a judgment of our works for reward, not for salvation. If you want to read a bit more about that, then look in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 15. So be like the dishonest manager, not in his dishonesty, but in his shrewdness. 
But then the other teaching that is added here in verses 10 to 15 really warns us not to be like the dishonest manager. Warnings against dishonesty, warnings against the love of money. Verses 10 to 12 talk about trust, being trusted with a little, and then you can be trusted with more. God gives responsibility to those who've been faithful in smaller things. God gives more responsibility. And there's the warning that we cannot serve God and money in verses 13 to 15. The Pharisees sneered at Jesus for this. Literally, they looked down their noses at him because they loved money. They thought they were righteous people, but they loved money. And so in these things, we're called not to be like the shrewd manager, the dishonest manager, but be honest in the way you deal with money. Be responsible in the things that are trusted to you. Make sure you love God more than you love money. So Jesus' parable and his teaching here leaves us with a few things to consider. How do we feel about that dishonest manager being commended? And how can we assess in our lives whether our money gets in the way of us serving God? Is God challenging you in any way about how you look after the worldly wealth that he's given to you? And what opportunities do we have to gain friends, to welcome us into eternal dwellings. May the Lord guide us in his truth and in living it out. Amen. One of the clear messages today is that God should be more important than money and wealth and possessions to us. And our final song reminds us that it's in Christ alone that our hope is found. Our hope for salvation, our hope in this life and our hope for the life to come are found in Christ, in Christ alone.
Lord, help us to trust in you each and every day. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you've done all that's necessary for our salvation. Help us to trust in you. Lord, help us to live our lives according to your ways and taking account of those things which are most important, especially finding opportunities to use all that we have to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Guide us and strengthen us, Lord, we pray. Amen. Can I remind you uh, to remain where you are for a while and the stewards will uh, ask you to leave at that, uh, in the appropriate order. And don't forget to keep your masks on until you're outside the building and to take all your possessions with you. Uh, do join us on Zoom for the chat uh, to a quarter to 12. If you're home by then, there should be time probably to make a cup of coffee and then join for chat. And at 6.30 this evening for prayer. Thank you.